Welcome to Nazarene Israel. I'm your host, Norman Willis, and this is Parashah Emor for 2022. And we've been talking all about being a set-apart people unto Yahweh, and that takes listening and also obeying what we hear, including all of Yahweh's written commandments. But some have written, some have asked, how do we do this? How can we hear Yahweh's voice? And how are we supposed to be able to abide 24-7 in Yeshua's spirit 100% all of the time? When you talk about if Yahweh is your co-pilot, switch seats. So how can we do that? We have lives, we have to hold down jobs. How can we let him lead? Well, to find out the answers to these questions and more, please join us for Parashah Emor 2022. Shalom. In Hebrew, the word emor means speak, and what we want to see is a special pattern in the speaking that repeats itself even unto today. Now, in Parashah Emor, Yahweh is speaking to his people, thus Parashah Emor. And what Yahweh is doing in speaking to his people is he is teaching them what his standards truly are. He's teaching the people what he wants, how he wants us to do things. And then Yahweh expects his priesthood to speak or teach in context his standards to all the people. That's how it's supposed to work. But one of the keys is the priesthood was never supposed to make up their own standards and rules. Rather, they were to pass along Yahweh's standards and rules that they heard from the prophet to the people. Are you listening, Brother Judah? Well, for example, in Vaikra or Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 1, we read, Yahweh said to Moshe, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aharon, and say to them, Basically, if you want to make me happy, then listen and do what I say. And then in turn, Moshe speaks or teaches Yahweh's words to Aharon and his sons, just like Yahweh says to do. What that means, though, and what we need to see here, the principle behind this, the precept behind this, is the prophet is going to hear Yahweh's words and then pass Yahweh's words along to the priesthood. And then the priesthood, in turn, is going to teach Yahweh's words to the people. The priesthood's not supposed to make up their own rules. Okay? But now we're going to see a very special pattern here. We need to take good note of this, tuck it away, because we're going to see this happen again and again and again throughout Scripture. And what we're going to see is that Yahweh is going to use the anointed prophet or the anointed judge, in this case, Moshe Hanavi, he's going to use the anointed prophet to transmit the correct doctrine or the correct Torah to the priesthood. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're saying it's the prophet who transmits the Torah to the priesthood, effectively training the priesthood. And then once the priesthood knows what to do, really, they should be able to take it from there. Now, sounds simple, but this is a very important pattern for us. We talk about it a little bit in our four-part mini-series on the Tabernacle of David, which is located in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 4. We hope to do a lot more with that study later. We could, we could talk about that a long time, but one of the most important things we see in that study is that the anointed judge, King David, was used to establish the correct doctrine for the priesthood, for the Melchizedekian order serving in the Tabernacle of David. And because David was a prophet, he could effectively, basically serve as a Melchizedekian priest. So the pattern that we see all throughout Scripture is that the anointed judge, or the anointed prophet, because a judge is a prophet, he's the one who delivers the Torah. He's the one who delivers the instructions to the priesthood. Okay, so we're going to see this pattern followed in King David's day, the prophet that instructed the Melchizedekian order. We also see it happening in Yeshua's day. We know that Yeshua was a prophet, and what did he do? He delivered the instructions to those who would purify themselves to become his bride. So it's the anointed judge or the prophet, which in our case was Yeshua, 
who gives Yahweh's instructions or Yahweh's Torah to the priesthood. Okay, then it's the priesthood's job to take it from there. Now the priesthood has to instruct all the people, make sure the people know what they're supposed to do, and tell them what Yahweh says to do and not do. Okay? The, the, the priests were never, ever, ever supposed to make up their own rules. Are you listening, Brother Judah? Okay. Uh, well, for, for their part, the people were to remain humble. We are all to remain humble. We're to remain teachable. We're supposed to do everything Yahweh says. Okay. But there's never been any commandment telling us we have to obey the rabbis. Okay. That's a fiction. That verse doesn't exist okay, because the rabbinical order is not commanded in Scripture. It's not part of Yahweh's will. In fact, as we speak about another place, he's planning to utterly destroy it. Are you listening, Brother Judah? Well, this week we want to spend more time in our Haftra prophetic portion and also in the Brit Hadashah, or the Renewed Covenant. But we're going to see the same pattern in the Haftra prophetic portion. So Yehezkel, or Ezekiel, chapter 44 and verse 23. Now, just for some perspective, this is timed in the future. Uh, Yahweh writes it as if it's already passed, but we know that it's in the future. It's passed for him because he lives outside of time. But for us, this is after the coming third temple, or what we call the anti-Yeshua or the anti-Messiah temple. Okay, so this is after the tribulation and after Armageddon. We talk all about that in the Revelation study. Now, this fourth temple, this is the good temple, the one in Ezekiel, we can trust that one. And the prophets have already taught the priesthood in this, in this context. The prophets have already taught the priesthood what Yahweh's standards are, because the Torah still applies. So now, but in this passage in particular, the renewed Levitical priests, this is after Armageddon, okay, they have the job of teaching Yahweh's people the difference between Chodesh and Chol, the set apart and the profane. Okay. Now, Brother Judah, excuse me, uh, how are you going to do that if you change the Torah that Yahweh gave to Moshe? Okay. If you're not going to follow Yahweh's words, how can you teach Yahweh's words to the people? Because you believe you can follow the majority opinion of the rabbis because there's many of you and only one of him that you outvote him or something like that. Well, you know, if we change his standards, how can we expect to teach his standards to the people? How can we teach his standards when we don't even know what they are? Because we thought we changed them. Okay, well, uh, we're not going to get on Judah. We have to be concerned about ourselves. We have to be concerned for Ephraim. We need to clean up our own house. And brothers and sisters, I've been in this movement since 1999. Our own house is a mess. Okay, and we need a teacher to help set us straight. We need a teacher to let us know what's going on. And this is precisely what Yeshua promises in his word. is a teacher who will teach us all what he likes. Okay? And that teacher is his spirit. Now, we talk about that more in our study on the ancient Hebrew wedding model. And we talk about it all throughout because that's what we're really doing is we're talking to Yeshua's best friend, which is his spirit, to learn what he likes so we can purify ourselves. But we see all through Scripture, we already know what he likes. It's just a question now, do we want to do it or not? Oh, big choice. Hmm, let's see. Do we want to be obedient or disobedient? Well, as we show in other places, the Spirit is a feminine, both in Hebrew and in Aramaic. So in Yohanan or John chapter 14, starting in verse 15, Yeshua is telling his disciples basically how to get the Spirit. They want to know what the Spirit's about, and notice what he says, because most people miss this completely. Most people have no idea what Yeshua is really saying, because they've never just stopped long enough to sit with it until it sinks completely in, and we become one with it, so to speak. But in verse 15, Yeshua says something so simple. It's something any father would say to his children. He says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Do what I said. Then he will pray the Father. First we obey, 
We love him enough to do what he says, find out what he wants. He wants us to keep his commandments. We're going to get around that? No, (laughs) Father forbid. We love him. We want to please him. We don't want to get around him. This is our husband we're talking about. If we will serve him by obeying his commandments, we will become refined. We will show him our sincerity. We will show him our commitment. And then he will pray the Father. And the Father will give us another helper that she may abide with us forever. She's called the Spirit of Truth, or the Ruach Emet, but it's the Spirit of Torah. Because if any man wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. Well, how does he, he, that takes the correct spirit. We know from the Psalms, Tehillim, and other places that Yahweh's Torah is the truth. David says, your instruction is truth. Your Torah is truth. Your law is truth. Well, Yeshua seemed to agree completely with this. He seems to have believed exactly the same way. Oh, imagine that. He and his father are one. He didn't come to do away with his father's law, like he says in Matthew 5 and verse 17. But Yeshua calls her the spirit of truth, or the Ruach Emet, whom the world cannot receive, because the world never made a commitment to Yahweh. Yeah, the world... They don't have a clue. They're not interested in the spiritual realm. They don't want to know. Babylon, they're interested in the spiritual realm, but they have other spirits in mind instead of the set-apart spirit. But Yeshua says, we know her because we have made a commitment. So because of that, Lady Wisdom shows us her face. Lady Wisdom shows us her favor. She helps us. She makes things clear to us. She teaches us while we're walking along in the way. This is the path. Turn it, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. And it ought to be clear to all of us, Yahweh is the truth. How is he going to send his son to tell his people to ignore him? Doesn't make any sense at all. Doesn't make any sense at all. The entire Christian world goes running after this mythology. The thing is, Yeshua is saying, if we love Yahweh, him do what he says it's the same thing yahweh says with the spirit hear my voice do what i say including everything that was written that's how he knows we love him that's how we know we love the truth because yahweh is truth yahweh is love yahweh is light so are we truly changed have we become truly transformed because we love the truth Are we inviting Lady Wisdom in moment by moment? You know, I mean, the thing about Lady Wisdom is she is really a lady, but we have to welcome her in or she's not going to come. She won't or she won't stay, but we have to, we have to welcome her in. If we're not welcoming her in, that's called quenching the spirit. Could have the spirit, not paying attention, not welcoming her in. Bye. (laughs) And that's where most of Ephraim goes, 99 plus percent. You know, the thing is, the more we focus on Yahweh, the closer we come to him. There's got to be something in us that's always paying attention to Yahweh, whether you're a visual person or auditory or whatever you, olfactory, perhaps, whatever you're doing, we need, there needs to be some part of us that's constantly tuned on Yahweh and some part that's constantly tuned on us and our behavior because Yeshua tells us to take heed to ourselves. So this shows commitment, and if we don't show commitment, then really it's kind of the same thing as idolatry because we've got something coming in between us and Yeshua. Well, what do you put in between you and Yeshua but an idol? This is your husband. This is our husband. What, we're going to put something in between us and our husband? What are you going to do? Put something? No, 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 no. No. So let's notice something essential. We have eyes to read. Isn't Yeshua effectively saying, okay, you say you want my spirit. Yeah? Okay. I'm saying obey the Torah commandments first. Let's understand what he's really saying here. Show me you love me by obeying the Torah commandments first. Yeah? Then after you show me some kind of commitment, 
by starting to guard the whole of the Torah, meaning all the commandments, then once you show me some commitment, that's when I'm going to pray my father for you. And that's when he's going to send you another helper. Is when I say, oh, this one, this, he's shown some commitment. She's shown some commitment. They're showing some commitment. Well, after we begin by obeying, then we can hear the Torah spoken. And at some point, we need to make a decision that we're going to do like King Josiah. And we're going to take charge of everything within our domain and make things right for Yahweh, everything under our roof, so to speak. Now, we get a lot of questions. We get correspondence. We get some very interesting emails uh, and requests. Uh, some people ask us, how can I get Yeshua's spirit without tithing? <clears throat> uh, so, so basically, they say, how can I get Yeshua's spirit and still enjoy my life in the world? And basically, the simple answer to that is you can't. Okay? None of us can. We're not supposed to be able to do that. Okay? That's by design. We're supposed to choose between Yahweh and the world. That's it. It's binary decision. And we can fool ourselves, and most of Ephraim does, uh, you know, uh, the drunkards of Ephraim. Uh, but the thing is, Yahweh literally makes it so we have to choose between him and the world. We have to, that's a decision we all have to make. That's what Joshua, the son of Nun, said. As for me and my house, we shall choose to serve Yahweh. Okay? And you know, this is a binary choice. It's an either or. Either we choose to serve Yahweh Elohim with everything we have, or he counts us traitors, treasonous, and worthy of death. Uh, to me, that's fair. So <laughs> he's going to send his son to die for us, and we're not going to respond after so many years. Uh, we'll, well, we'll talk next week about the, the fig tree that didn't produce fruit, but uh, we'll talk about that then. So... I think what we need to say, brothers, is sisters, is that I think there's some of us who've never truly stopped and sat down and counted the cost. Uh, you know, so if we have eyes to read what we're looking at here in Scripture, doesn't that mean, paraphrasing, doesn't that mean if we don't keep the whole of the Torah, he won't pray the Father? Meaning, we won't get his spirit. You know, I mean, if we're going to serve Yeshua as our king, or we're going to try for the, the bridehood, I mean, don't you think it makes sense? We better learn who he is, what he wants, and better do what he says, better give it to him, better make him happy, if we want to be taken as his bride. Well, the same theme is going to continue in the Brit Hadashah, or the Renewed Covenant portion. So we go to Yohanan or John, chapter 11, and verse 21, and he says, he who has my commandments and, oh, oh, there's that word, keeps them, shomer, guards my commandments, it's he who loves me. Remember, Yeshua was the angel or the mal, mal he was the angel or the messenger that was sent before our forefathers when we were exiting Egypt after the first Pesach. So Yeshua was the one to give us the Torah. That's our bridal covenant contract. Yeshua says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, who does my commandments, who keeps the bridal covenant contract, who keeps the plan for purification, it's he who loves me. It's he who cares enough to become transformed so he can serve me or she can serve me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I also will love him. Oh, and here's a special word. And will manifest myself to him. You know, a lot of people might think they have the Spirit. How many people think they can manifest Yeshua or be open to be used as an empty vessel for Yeshua to manifest his will through? Not that we are Yeshua, but that we allow ourselves to manifest Yeshua's will through us. Okay, well, this means Yeshua manifests in us. Okay, that's the goal. That's the renewed creation we're headed for. Here at Armageddon, we know everything's going to change after Armageddon. Yeah, this is what we're headed for. This is the goal. This is what we want. Become a renewed creature. 
led of the spirit, and not of the flesh. Oh, brothers, sisters, the spirit of truth. Okay, we depend upon the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. Okay, but notice, isn't Yeshua telling us it's only given to those who have already made the choice to keep the whole of the Torah? And doesn't he give it to those who lay down their lives in the world? Because that's what the Torah is talking about. And by ignoring the things of the world, by ignoring the t-ball and the rotary clubs and the camping vacations and the this party, that party, it makes more time to serve him. It's not just a check. Oh, I believe Yeshua check, said a prayer check. No, it makes more time for us to volunteer and serve him to show our love for him by helping to build his kingdom. So he gives the spirit to the people who've already made the choice to help him build his kingdom. And he knows that his yardstick is they're keeping all of his commandments. That's why he said in Matthew 5 and verse 17, not to think he came to do away with the bridal covenant contract with the ketubah. Okay. But the spirit, the spirit, in Scripture, it's only given to those who are already doing their best to further Elohim's kingdom, or in our case, to help Yeshua build his kingdom. He doesn't just give the, the Spirit gratuitously. I've seen all kinds of people take the bath, so to speak, but their hearts don't change. They don't seek Elohim. They don't seek to be filled by him. It's like you got to start by asking, seeking, and knocking. Okay, well, you know, we kind of have to remember who Yahweh is, right? So he's a king, he's a war Elohim, right? So what's, what's a war Elohim like? And he's got that kind of power. And he wants us to humble ourselves and serve him. What does that look like for us? What are we supposed to do like? Okay, so is, is, a, is a war Elohim like that just going to pass out the Spirit gratuitously to people who are not going to obey? He might pass out the Spirit, but do they have the proper witness they're keeping the Torah? Remember, we've got to have both. We've got to have both the letter of the Torah and the Spirit because the goal is to hear and obey His voice, including all the written commandments. It's a two-part deal. This, these are two things that show us whether we truly have the Spirit whether we're truly disciplining ourselves to walk according to it. So go figure. Yahweh's going to give the Spirit to those who want to serve Him according to the way He wants to be served, not the way we want to serve Him, the way He says He wants to be served. So a lot of us, you know, we receive the gift of the Spirit, and we know it, we just don't use it for Him. We don't discipline ourselves to put Him first. Can we see how selfish that is? You know, just talking between brothers, what we always need to be asking ourselves is, what would Yahweh get out of it? Would Yahweh like it if we asked that? Would that do anything for Yeshua? If, if Yahweh likes it, it's a sure bet Yeshua's going to like it also. So, but still the question remains, what are we asking him for? Why are we asking him for it? Are we doing it for his purposes or for our own? Well, are we truly dead to our flesh? Are we truly walking in his spirit and not our own flesh? Well, verse 26, Yeshua tells us that the helper, the Ruach HaKadosh, or the set-apart spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, she will teach you all things. And, get this, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So this is, the Spirit is bringing up the fact that we're supposed to be ordered and organized a certain way. She is the one who teaches us all these things. If we are listening, if we remain teachable, she is the one who will bring to mind all the things that Yeshua said to our forerunners, the apostles. And in context, remembering that he's the Malach that Yahweh sent before our forefathers coming out of Egypt, He's also the one who gave the Torah to our forefathers in the wilderness. So these are all the things that the Spirit is going to bring to mind 
if we dedicate ourselves such that we begin doing everything that Scripture says to do. Once we begin doing what Scripture says to do, then we can receive the Spirit. But people say, but I don't want to do everything Scripture says. Can't I get the gift of the Spirit without doing everything Scripture says to do first? <laughs> yeah, some amazing questions we get. Some amazing conversations. You know, how, how can I get... Basically, how can I get the set-apart spirit without giving him anything? How can, I, how can I get the gift of the spirit, but I don't want to give, I don't want to volunteer, I don't want to give anything back to him. I, I just want to take. I, I want gifts, and I want to pray for stuff, and I want him to look out for me, but I don't want to give anything to build his son a kingdom. How can I get the spirit without really buying in? And the answer is, you can't. There's, there's no way. There's no possible way. Uh, you know, I mean, we want Yeshua's spirit, right? Okay, well, Yeshua tithed and volunteered, right? He was as active as he could be, in fact. So if we have Yeshua's spirit, then don't we also need to tithe and volunteer as much as we can? Do we get it? Do we know what Yeshua's spirit is? It's so easy. It's like people just don't think about it. I think they don't. People don't think it through. I, I guess I don't. I don't really know. Uh, but one way or another, we all have to do what he says, and we have to want it. We have to be eager for it, as a bride is eager to please her husband, just as the husband is eager to provide for his bride and looks out for her, and these kind of things. The bride is also needs to be eager to serve her husband, and if she doesn't because she's not obeying the commandments, she's not refining herself according to the ketubah, he's under no obligation. So we're showing up. We're, we are bags of dust. and We want to become altar-worthy. We have to be ready to change. We have to be ready to become altered. You know, and the problem is, most of us, we don't really want to be spiritually transformed yet. I, mean, I guess we don't, we don't, we're not ready, we're not willing to be changed 100% yet, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Just from guessing, from surmising from people's behavior. But what Scripture says is that if we want the good gifts He has for those who love Him, okay, first... We must sign up, basically, for Yeshua's program. We talk about that in Acts chapter 15 order. We have to show our allegiance to him as our king by obeying the things that are written in Scripture because of the set-apart spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Once we show our willingness to obey all the things, once we're willing to obey all the the do's and don'ts, then he's going to send his spirit to teach us all things. Once we show him that dedication and love, he's going to pray the Father. The Father's going to send the spirit. He's not going to give the spirit to people who are lukewarm. <laughs> Why should he do that? I mean, what, 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 what benefit is it to him? He's going to cast his pearls before swine so that we can ignore his commandments in a spiritual way. Oh, Father, please give me your spirit so I can ignore your commandments in a spiritual way. I want to be more spiritual, Father, but I don't really want to do everything your word says. It's, you know, some of the correspondence we get boils down to this. You know, and the problem is, it's just so very simple. He wants a people who are attentive to him and are listening to him and want to speak and act according to his words. He wants to restore that relationship that was lost in the Garden of Eden. And he's breaking it down for us. We couldn't handle it when we first came out of Egypt. So he's breaking it down for us. He gives us a whole list of things to do as a nation with everyone involved. No one allowed to sit on the sidelines. No one allowed to sit on the benches. You do that, you're out and not in a good way. So if we will do everything that the Spirit says, plus all the written commandments, then the Father will love us, and He's going to take us as His Son's bride. He's going to take extra special care of us. It means hard work, a lot of hard work, but He's going to take care of us. But if we do any, here's the problem, and we've forgotten this since the days of 
kingships of Europe and before, uh, if we do anything less than our utmost for our king, look out. So it's been a long time since Ephraim's lived under kingships. So we've forgotten what kingships are like. Well, Yeshua is a king. So what does our king want? Well, what our king, what our husband wants is the same thing it's always been. He wants us to hear. He wants to restore the relationship that was lost in the Garden of Eden. He wants us to hear his voice and be diligent to do everything he says. And we're also responsible for his written word because that's just when he spoke earlier and someone wrote it down. Uh, so, you know, we're accountable to the written word and additionally to his spirit. Uh, if we don't hear in the spirit, then if we're not willing to make that effort, uh, you know, then the, the solution is you have to come into right relationship with someone that is hearing the spirit. And that, so the, really there's, there's no option. Basically, when we understand what scripture is saying uh, in truth, uh, Yeshua has a program and he wants us all to participate in it. And it costs us our life in the world. It costs us our life in Egypt. And plus, we're further told to come out of Babylon, the deception, uh, where you follow your desires and call that the anointing or whatever they do. But the, so this is the question, brothers, sisters, are we diligently listening for his voice? And are we diligently doing what we hear? And are we diligently doing everything that's in the written word? That's the message we take from the Torah portion. Well, now we come to our half to a prophetic portion. And what we're going to see here is that if we want to set ourselves apart from the world, to set ourselves apart unto Yahweh, and if we want to learn everything by his spirit, then the very first thing that we need to realize coming out of Egypt is that our focus needs to change. So in Egypt, we're focused on the world and the things of the world our desires in the world, the lusts of our eyes, the lusts of our flesh, and pride. These things are all acceptable to chase after riches and the things the moth can destroy, uh, things that the thief can break in and steal. Our focus needs to be different than that. We need to be different than the rest of the people in the world. So this is what Yahweh was trying to help our forefathers understand, was that we need to develop a spiritual focus of course, our forefathers didn't do the best on that, or at least not with the spiritual focus that's also obedient to Yahweh. Spiritual focus we have, just we need a spiritual focus that obeys all of the written commands. So now in Yehezkel or Ezekiel chapter 44, we also see that the priest's focus was to be on Yahweh and his service 100% of the time, or rather in the future, the renewed Levitical priesthood's focus is to be upon Yahweh and upon his service 100% of the time, or at least during the times that they're on duty. Now, maybe they didn't realize it, but their focus was always supposed to be on his spirit. Too bad they didn't figure that one out. Now, verse 28 tells us the Levitical priests were not supposed to have any earthly inheritance whatsoever. And that's because Yahweh wanted him to be their inheritance, 100%. You know, in the one hand, you have the riches of the world, and in the other hand, you have your relationship with Yahweh. Choose. Yeah, should be that quick. So, sure, the Levitical priesthood had to have the resources needed to do the job. It takes a lot of money to run a temple the right way. Uh, the Levitical priesthood was around 8% of the population. And it's going to take all of us in the Melchizedekian order working together according to Yeshua's instructions in order to establish Yeshua's kingdom the way he says he wants us to do. It takes all of us to obey Yeshua the way he wants us to. So, But further, if anyone wants to join the priesthood one day or perhaps serve as a congregational elder or serve as a congregational deacon, uh, we need to see something critical. And that's what we need to see, and which is that we have the same focus as Yeshua had, which was the same focus as the Levites were supposed to have. So in 
Ezekiel 44, you know, well, what we see is that Yeshua didn't care about any earthly thing. What Yeshua cared about was building his father's kingdom. That's Yeshua's main focus. And since Yeshua is the prophet who established the Torah or the operating instructions for his renewed Melchizedekian priesthood, it was completely correct of him to have the same focus as his father. It was completely correct of him to have the same focus of the Torah, considering he's the one who gave us the Torah as we're coming out of Egypt. So, you know, but the focus on him and his spirit is critical. Like they talk about, you can't legislate morality. Uh, you know, and if you're going to work in the priesthood, someone's going to handle a lot of money. You're going to work in government service. Someone's going to handle a lot of money. Uh, anything you do in business, we need to keep our eyes on him and upon the kingdom. That's what, that's what the transformation is all about. You know, and, and don't be part of the mystery Babylon in disguise in the Messianic movement, like some of the Messianic book salesmen, uh, bringing home six-figure-plus incomes. Uh, coming to my parlor, said the wolf to the sheep. Uh, you know, we need to be doing things with the correct heart. And if we don't have the correct heart, then we can't distinguish between, let's say, a narrow and afflicted path versus a broad, easy road where people don't really feel like they have to leave the world, don't really have to leave Babylon, don't really have to do like Yeshua did. They just have to worship Yeshua. I have to become transformed, just have to worship Yeshua. That's the church right there. I don't have to change. I just have to worship him, put some money in the bucket. And I go on about my life in the world. That's Mystery Babylon. Well, this all brings us to our Brit Hadashah, or our Renewed Covenant portion. And here we're in Luca, or Luke, chapters 11 and 12. And what we're going to see through this is that Yeshua is teaching us about the correct spirit by teaching us about the correct attitudes that we're supposed to have. And basically, that's because an attitude is a spirit. It's the same thing. It's just one is an English way of saying it, and one is the ancient Hebrew way of saying it. The ancient Hebrew way is better, of course. But the question is, what attitude do we, as his believers, as his disciples, hopefully, what attitude or attitudes do we choose to take? What attitude or attitudes, what spirits do we choose to have? What do we take? Life is a blank slate sometimes in certain respects. What are we, what are we giving place to? So in each moment of our lives, are we giving place to Yahweh or are we giving place to Satan? Are we giving place to the light? Or are we giving place to darkness? Are we giving place to... What, what, are, what are we giving place to? Okay, maybe the grammar police will you know, knock, knock. It's the, okay, to whom are we giving place? Okay, well, uh, that kind of case logic distinction doesn't exist in Hebrew, so <laughs> we're going to leave that one alone. But the point is, we, if we call ourselves his disciples, we need to be ready to make some real changes. If we're going to go up to his altar, then don't we need to be ready to become altered? <laughs> There's things that we need to be doing on our own. We need to show some initiative. Uh, you know, and it's really sad because most Christians, Mystery Babylon, and even most Messianics and Ephraimites are still in Mystery Babylon. Uh, they're still treating like Yahweh, like he's some kind of a genie in a bottle or something. You just, just rub a little and you get whatever you want. <laughs> you just, just say the right words and you get whatever you want. It never occurs to them to think about the fact, to imagine what it must be like to literally be Yahweh's slaves and everything that comes along with that. You know, I mean, Yahweh wants his servants to suit up and show up for duty. You know, you think maybe Yahweh might want his servants to ask him what he wants done today? <laughs> you know, uh, his will be done. It's like not, oh, can I have this? And, oh, can I have that? And, oh, and would you please bless me in this way? And can I have that over there? Would you please bless me in that way over there? Oh, this is so, this is the bless me club oh, with your host. Give me more. So, you know, I mean, what Yeshua is saying is, listen, this is not, 
this is not that. If we want his spirit, we need to start by remembering that we are slaves. We're slave princesses in training who need to obey all of the ketubah. Then it's just, we were bought with a price. <laughs> and in scripture, Hebrew servants are always very attentive to their masters. Think about Eliezer. They're trustworthy. They can be sent on mission to do very important things, and they're, they're disciplined to their master's instructions. Are we? So Yeshua is telling us that when we pray, the goal is not to ask for what we want, right? Gimme, gimme, gimme more. Instead, it's not that. That's Mystery Babylon. Instead, the goal is to ask him what he wants. Father, thank you for calling us to your service. What would you like us to do today, Father? You know, uh, we're not trying to ask him for more. We're trying to show him that we want to please him more. We ask him, Father, how can we become more pleasing to you? It's just like any employee. A good employee should ask their boss, how can they do better? A good employee should ask that. Are we asking Yahweh how we can do better every day? And are we always listening for his response? Are we always listening for his direction? And scripture says Yahweh speaks but once. He sees no need for twice. So we need to be listening at all times, especially when we're upset. That's especially when we need to listen. So Yaakov or James chapter 4 and verse 3 tells us that the problem with most of us, this is talking, he's talking to us. He's talking to Ephraim. <laughs> the problem with most of us is that we, we're not asking Yahweh to show us what he wants, but we're asking for what we want. In other words, we ask amiss so we can spend it on our lusts, Yaakov says. And that's basically prosperity doctrine in a nutshell. Give me this and give me that oh, and so I can give praise and worship to you. So you become conformed to Yeshua's walk. <laughs> they're, they're basically disguising greed and vanity as the worship of the living Elohim. And it's repugnant to him. You know, but if we are asking Yahweh for what we want so we can spend it on ourselves, then who do we really have set on the throne? Really? Have we set him on our throne or are we still sitting on our thrones and he's still washing our feet? We need to set him on his throne. We need to go wash his feet. We need to show up for service. But 99% of the people walk a broad, easy road seeking what they want. Elohim's looking to see those who want to be different, who understand they've sat down, they've counted the cost. They know it's not going to be free. <laughs> the, the, the disciples didn't do everything in the first century, so now we don't have to do anything. That's not it. And I mean, that's what you can learn in the Messianic movement, but that's not it. So we have a, there's a big job he's given us to do, and it takes all of us to do it. But let's notice what Yeshua says here in his model prayer for those who consider themselves to be his disciples. And that's in Luke chapter 11, Luca chapter 11. First, Yeshua says we should recognize that Yahweh is a set-apart Elohim. He's our set-apart Elohim. Okay, the first commandment. Okay, and what that means is we need to treat Yahweh like he is set-apart. And There's a lot of stories we could get into. You know, people basically in the world, when you're in the world, in the business world, uh, it's how much can you get for how little? And that's the game. How much can you get for how little? So many people bringing that attitude toward the worship of Yahweh. And it's repugnant to Yahweh. It's offensive to him because we value him the same thing as the world. So, you know, I mean, what, what does this all mean? What, what, what should it look like? Or what does it look like? What should it look like? Well, if we can just imagine, just imagine ourselves being transported back to King David's time, or perhaps King David, if he's raised today, uh, how are we going to treat the man who wins Yahweh's wars? You know, if he's the king, how are we going to treat him? 
if, if King David told us to do something, wouldn't we hasten lickety split to do everything King David said, especially with regards to the tabernacle of David, if we consider ourselves in any kind of a ministerial capacity? Would we hasten to obey King David's instructions? Okay, well, if we would hasten to heed King David's instructions, then what is with Ephraim today that we as his people are not obeying his instructions as his people? You know what I'm saying? Why are we not all eagerly doing everything Scripture says to do? And I'm talking about right now, today. Where's the dedication? Where's the commitment? And people say, well, how can I get the Spirit without making such kind of a commitment? Brother, sister, why should Yahweh entrust us with what's basically the crown jewels, with his spirit, his son's spirit, if we're not showing him any loyalty. You know, in the military, there's an old saying, which is familiarity breeds contempt. And that's a true saying. And for most Ephraimites that I have met, for most Ephraimites I've seen, you know, once we get to know Yahweh, or once we figure we've got a relationship with Yahweh, <laughs> we basically take him for granted meaning we don't keep his commands because we're no longer really scared of him. He's no longer truly a set-apart Elohim in our eyes. There's no longer fire and thunder and sound of trumpet, lightning on the mountain. So we don't think about Yahweh being here among us like that. So we forget to be scared. We figure, well, there's no problem. But the problem is Yahweh is looking to see who loves him enough to take action even when they're not being pushed. You know, it, okay, well, we're not really scared. Nothing's going on, it seems. Well, we don't really love him either. So we don't fear him. We don't love him. What do we need to do what he says for? Either if we loved him, we would do what he said. If we loved him, we'd do all that he said, eagerly. We'd be happy to do it. We'd be encouraging other people to do it. But if we don't really love him, and we don't really fear him, why do what he says? So, you know, I mean, if this applies to anyone, I mean, this is what we take heed to our spirit. I mean, today is the day to soften the neck. Today is the day to soften the heart. Today is the day of salvation. Yohanan, or John, chapter 3 and verse 4 says, we're not supposed to pray for stuff that we want just so we can have more good stuff here in the world. Okay? It says not to pray for what we want so we can spend it on our own lusts. Rather, we're supposed to pray for what he wants his will be done so that we and our families can serve him. That's what we're supposed to be praying for. That's the first part of the disciples' prayer. Focus on him. We're not focusing on ourselves anymore. Our focus becomes on him. When the disciples focused on Yeshua, they keep it could walk on water. Take his eyes off of Yeshua, puts them on the wind and the waves of the world. Down you go. Second in the disciples' prayer, Yeshua tells us to pray that we would become transformed, perhaps like Shaul talks about, by the renewing of our minds, as it were. Well, we become transformed so that our wants begin to align more and more with what he wants. Again, we're changing our focus. Now we're asking, how can we conform ourselves to his will? Not how we can conform him to our will, how can we conform ourselves to his will? You know, if we're going to be his helper, then are we helping him? Or are we only asking him to give us what we want all the time? We never really think about what he wants. Maybe we like it that way. Maybe we never thought about it. Hear the rod, Scripture says. Well, third in Yeshua's 
disciples prayer, his model prayer, he tells us that our number one single priority, numero uno priority every day should be to make sure that Yahweh is getting what he wants. Isn't that what it says? I mean, think about it. If Yahweh ain't happy, ain't nobody going to be happy. Ephraim body going to be very unhappy. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, fourth, Yeshua's disciples' prayer shows us we are to seek to please Yahweh before anything else in life. He's our king. In medieval Europe, in Christian Europe, you swore to protect your king with your life. You told your king his life was more precious than yours, and that's how you behave. And if you didn't agree to that, if you didn't want to do that, that was considered treason, punishable by death. So considering that Yeshua also is a king, how do we think Yeshua looks at that? We don't want to do everything he said like good citizens of his realm. Well, let's just take a giant step back together. Let's just get a, get a different perspective. Okay, so if we are truly Yeshua's servants in our hearts, then don't we need to have a care that our husband is getting what he wants? You know, or, or, or how about this? Hey, boss, I want you to help me get what I want. I don't really care about what you want. I don't even hear about what you want. Or I'll read about it, but don't expect me to do it. I mean, how many of us, that's maybe not what we say, but that's maybe how we behave. You know, hey, beloved bridegroom, you are so great. You are the love of my life. I love you so much. I love you more than life itself. That's why I don't need to volunteer or get involved or tithe or support the ministry in any way. You'll still marry me if I break all the wedding vows, right? <coughs> You'll still marry me if I break the Torah, right? <coughs> Anyone in Ephraim living here? Ephraim body home? Okay, this is some really powerful stuff in this passage. If people take the time to stop and think about what it truly says, what is Yeshua truly asking us to do for him? Fifth, Yeshua tells us to ask Yahweh for our daily needs, day by day. <laughs> That's different than what goes on in prosperity gospel churches. And then asking him for our daily needs then trust as humble servants that he will give us what we need to serve him. And now it says, and no, this doesn't mean that we get out of volunteering and tithing because we bought a house and we have to pay the mortgage. No, it doesn't mean Yahweh is going to give us a pass on volunteering time and tithing because we have to put our children through Masonic Lodge College or something like that. You know, no, it doesn't mean that <laughs> it doesn't mean we're going to pray that you will win the lottery. We get asked questions like this. It's like, really? Seriously? Are you kidding? So we're not going to pray that you're going to win the lottery. And then after you win the lottery and become rich, then you can start to tithe. <laughs> How many times do we get asked these things? I mean, you think it's like, whoa, but we get letters like this. So, brothers, sisters, that's what's called praying for your own lusts. That's what's called praying so you can spend it on your own lusts. It's a sign of a completely wrong spirit. It's the sign of a completely wrong heart condition. When we spend our time to pray and ask Yahweh for what we want, but then spend it on our own lusts, what does that do for Yahweh? What does that do for our king? What does that do for our husband, Yeshua? Okay. The problem with these prayer requests is they don't place the kingdom of Elohim first. That means they're of a wrong spirit. What are they of? They're of the flesh. One way or another, they're of the flesh. They're of a wrong spirit. You know, Luke 16 and verse 10 is pretty clear, isn't it? 
you know, brothers, sisters, if we're not willing to give Elohim what is Elohim's, what are we doing? If we're not going to give Elohim what it says in Scripture to give Elohim, including dedication, service, our tithes, our volunteer time, what are we doing? We can lie to ourselves, you know, change the channel, find another find another YouTube channel, tell you something we, we like to hear. Okay, you know, we, we might think that because the the numbers are small, we, we're not we're not making this particular some some of the individuals that ask this. You know, I mean, you know, millionaires, you know, people they're they're buying airplanes, uh, spending a million and a quarter dollars. One million two hundred fifty thousand dollars an airplane. You don't have any money to tithe. No money for Yahweh. No money to build the Yeshua's kingdom. You know, I mean, I've met some amazing things. Uh, people saying, "Well, please pray for me that I'll win the lotto. If I win the lottery, then I'll start tithing." <laughs> I mean, okay. So wait a minute. Okay, where is our focus? Who are we trying to serve with this? Okay, and what makes we think, what makes us think we're going to be faithful all of a sudden when the numbers get big? Okay, if we can't be faithful in little things like money, okay, Martin Luther, well, Martin Luther anyway, but, but Martin Luther made a joke. He said, uh, the last part of a man to be converted is his wallet. Okay, we, you know, we have a love-hate relationship with Martin Luther because he was anti-Semitic later in life. But if we can't be faithful in little things like money, then how are we going to claim to be faithful in big things like saving souls, like bringing people to Yeshua, like bringing people back to their husband because the ministry is starving for funding? Okay, tell me again how this is loving Yeshua, a loving Yahweh with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, but not with our money and not with our time. How does that work? Tell me again how that works, because I don't I don't understand that. You know, if we're not willing to change for Yeshua, then how did we change for Yeshua? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Sixth, Yeshua tells us not to doubt and not to worry over our daily needs. It says Yahweh already knows what we need before we even ask him. Okay, so why do we worry? Why not rather just give thanks for what Yahweh provides and save the asking for when we truly need something that is needed to advance the Great Commission? Where is our focus? That's what this prayer helps us to do, is to refocus, not on the things of the world, but upon the things of the Spirit. Okay? If we trust Him, why do we worry? And there's an old saying, if you pray, don't worry. And if you're still worrying, you're not done praying yet. Okay, seventh, Yeshua tells us to pray that we will forgive one another as we also want to be forgiven. Maybe he's saving the, the hardest one for last. Uh, but you know, we have a study on forgiveness in the Nazarene Israel website. I believe it's in Nazarene Scripture Studies Volume 1. If it's not in 1, it's in 2. Uh, if anyone has problems with forgiveness, I, I recommend reading that. Because uh, the old saying is true. The air is human and to hold grudges is of the devil. But if you forgive your neighbors and also your enemies, that cannot be done under human powers. That is divine. So, you know, we, we can't do that without his spirit. That's divine. No way. We can't do that alone. So that's why in verse 9, Yeshua tells us to ask Seek, knock, because he tells us that the Ephraim body who asks receives. Okay, the Ephraim body who seeks, he finds. And the Ephraim body who knocks, it shall be open. Okay, but don't just stop with the calling. Okay, keep knocking until you get the election. Most people, they stop at the calling, they've received the Spirit. Are they walking in it? Ooh, not yet. Ooh, ouch. I'm not saying you won't make it to the land, but if you don't correct that attitude, you're not going to like the ride. Okay, 
this word to the wise is sufficient. You know, we, we know we have the election because we eagerly want to do all we can for our husband, whom we love. We want to do what we can for him. We want to be his Proverbs 31 bride. We want to serve him to the utmost of our abilities, thinking of ourselves only as servants. That's it. We just, we, Father, please take me back as one of your hired, as one of your servants. And, and we, don't, we don't stop for anything less than that because if we do, it's not the right spirit. So that's what Yeshua is trying to help us learn is how to walk in a correct spirit. What does that look like? And what does it look like to walk in the correct spirit? So then a certain woman shouts out, blessed is the womb that bore you and blessed are the breasts which nursed you. But Yeshua said more than that, Blessed are those who hear the word of Elohim and keep it, meaning to shomer it or to guard it, like good shomeronim, good guardians of the Torah. <laughs> you know, can't we tell? Can't we tell Yeshua still expects us to hear and obey Yahweh's voice through our connection with Him, us in Him and Him in us, Him in the Father and the Father in Him? You know, the Ruach HaKadosh is supposed to be our connection. It's supposed to be our lifeline. It's supposed to be our helper so we can learn to walk in the Spirit, so we can learn how to help build Yeshua's true kingdom so we can get a reward when Yeshua comes because he tells us his reward is with him to give to everyone according to his work. People are like, well, how do I get the Spirit? I mean, really, I got to do all the stuff, it says? How do you solve a problem like Ephraim? <laughs> Brothers, mm. <laughs> we're to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for everyone, for all. It's a specific format. We need to do it. Yeshua says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find the faith on the earth? So there's lots of people who are believers, but the rewards are to the disciples. Enough said. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the point is, the point, these, these questions, it's like, I don't understand. These questions, they blank my mind because it's like, if we're not going to build, if we don't want Yeshua's spirit so we can use it to do the same things he's doing, does not compute. It's like well, we're asking for Yeshua's spirit. So if we have Yeshua's spirit, we're going to do the same things Yeshua's spirit is doing, which is building his kingdom. He's, he's a prince. He's going to be a king. He's gone off to receive a kingdom for himself in return. And he wants his servants to be busy with their minas while he's gone. Well, what do we want the Spirit for? Do we want it to build His kingdom? Or do we want to have the Spirit so we have the power of the Spirit, so we can hear things in the Spirit and use them for ourselves, so we know how to pray more effectively, be able to spend things on our own lusts, to get around keeping His commandments? What, 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 what do we want the Spirit for? What do we want it for? Because if we truly love Him, we shall know concerning the doctrine and his spirit will be given to us and we will use it to build Yeshua's kingdom. Like he tells us to do, like we explain in our study on Acts chapter 15 order and also in our study on Torah government, if you want a top level approach. <laughs> yeah, but what if we don't want to build his kingdom? We don't want to give anything back to Yahweh of our time, and our money, you know? What do you need Yeshua's spirit for? You don't want to build Yeshua's kingdom. What do you need his spirit for? You don't want to make a contribution like Yeshua did. What do you need Yeshua's spirit for? Because Yeshua's spirit, by definition, is going to lead us to build his kingdom. <laughs> you know, we've already established in the conversation that certain people don't really want to do that. What reward do they have? 
you know, it's true that if we don't have his spirit, we're not going to be part of the bride. I mean, that much is, that's pretty clear, right? And do we understand? We've already covered it earlier in the series. We probably won't survive the tribulation without his spirit without doing the things his spirit will lead us to do. But if we're not wanting to help build his kingdom, then what do we want the spirit for? He doesn't just hand out his son's spirit to anyone who wants to survive the tribulation. He only gives his son's spirit out to those who really want to love his son and want to help him build the kingdom he himself sent his son to build. So Yahweh commanded Yeshua. Yeshua gave us instructions, and he's gone off to receive the kingdom for himself. And when he returns, he wants to know who did what with the money. What we do with the mina. Well, okay, so when we read Luca or Luke chapter 12, Yeshua continues to train his disciples to focus on Elohim and his kingdom not on the things of the world. We're going to set ourselves apart from the things of the world and the lusts of it and our desires in the flesh, the pride of our lives. We're not going to focus on those. We're going to immerse ourselves, wash ourselves clean daily if we have to, to get it to stick. Okay? Yeah, I mean, I'll leave you to read it, but let's take a look at Luke chapter 12 in the context that Yeshua warns us about covetousness in verse 15. And then in verse 31, he says to seek first our husband, Yeshua. Okay? Seek first our relationship with our husband, Yeshua. What's he saying? He's saying, seek first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness. In context, that means seek his level of Torah obedience. How obedient was Yeshua to the Torah? Completely. Okay, we're to seek his righteousness. We're to seek his level of Torah obedience. And if we'll do that out of love for him and a genuine desire to serve him, then everything else is going to follow. Okay, verse 33, Yeshua tells us not to be greedy okay, and not to be stupid. Yeah, if we want his spirit, why don't we quit thinking about all the good things that money can buy us? Okay. When we enlisted in Yeshua's spiritual army, in Yahweh's, his father Yahweh's spiritual army, okay, the things of the world are not ours anymore. Those things belong to the world. Just like the Levitical priesthood was to set itself apart from any inheritance in the world, so we too in the Melchizedekian order are to set ourselves apart from the desires and the defilements of the flesh and of the world. Yeah, we still need to handle money in the kingdom, but the thing is the focus is different. You know, it's like the difference between a good natural medical doctor who loves and cares about his clients and is trying to do his best for them on the one hand, and a bad natural medical doctor who's just trying to make a lot of money on the other. That kind of a thing. You know, I mean, a lot more money changes hands in a marriage than ever changes hands in what we call normal prostitution anyway. I'm, we're not talking about the Sabatine Frankists and their, and their trafficking rings. Uh, time wounds all heals. Those people, they'll get theirs. Uh, but even though there's a lot of money changing hands in a marriage, the thing is the marriage is nonetheless set apart because there's supposed to be a commitment and love between the parties before they become intimate. So, uh, if you want to establish a global spiritual government, take some operating funds. You can't run the Levitical order with nothing. It doesn't run on air. It can't be helped. You know. But if we're hard-hearted towards our Elohim, and we're hard-hearted towards our husband, who was the one who gave his father's instructions to us, him as the prophet, uh, then we don't want to do anything with our time and our money. Uh, how are we going to please Elohim? We're still thinking about ourselves as independent, sovereign individuals, 
sovereign people. And this, is a de- this is a concept for democracy. In the democracy, you have power sharing between independent sovereigns, and everyone agrees to concede a little bit of power toward the, the joint goal, but there's no, there's no surrendering to Yahweh's spirit. There's no surrendering to Yeshua's spirit in a democracy. It's a completely wrong spirit. Mystery Babylon tolerates it. It's compatible with Mystery Babylon. It's not compatible with, with Yahweh's word. So you know, we're still thinking about our money, our time, our lives. How are we his slaves? How are we his dedicated servants who are bought with a price? In verse 34, our husband tells us that where we put our treasure, that's where our heart is. What that means is we spend our money on the things we love, right? So how much of our time and how much of our money are we spending on building Yeshua's kingdom? Like he asks. You know, you can tell a lot about a person's faith by looking at their calendar, by looking at their wallet. They find out where they freely spend their time and find out where they freely spend their money. That's going to tell you all sorts of things about what kind of person they really are. Verse 35, we're supposed to keep our lamps burning for him continually, just like the wise virgins. Verse 42, we're told to be ready when our master comes, just like the wise virgins. I don't know about you, I don't feel ready. I I need to prepare. Okay, verse 48, Yeshua tells us that those who have been given much, they're going to have to account for what they did with it. So, you know, brothers, uh, sisters, what are we doing for him? What are we doing with our minas? Are we spending them on ourselves? Uh, Are we spending them on Yeshua? What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with our saved lives? That's the, that's the meaning behind the Mina. Um, you know, when we get to the judgment, Yahweh's going to take a look. He's going to ask us what we did with our time and our money, right? Oh, no, excuse me. He's going to ask us what we did with his time and his money, right? Because we're bought with a price. So what are our priorities? You know, we're wanting his spirit. Uh, are we remembering always the day of judgment? Are we remembering that we're going to be held accountable to what everything we've done, everything we've failed to do for him? Well, if the Torah is a codification of Yahweh's spirit, then is there a codification also of what Yeshua is saying? Okay, you know, what is the spirit Yeshua says we need to have? If we take a look here, Yeshua is teaching us to place Yahweh's priorities first. A first commandment. Place Yahweh Yeshua's kingdom first. First commandment. Trust Yahweh for all of our needs and to keep our focus on him. Second commandment. And people miss this one all the time. He wants us to place our treasures in him, especially if we consider ourselves part of the priesthood. They were not to have an inheritance in the world. He wants us to place all of our treasures in him. He wants us not to place our treasures on worldly desires. He doesn't like it when we're double-minded. We're trying to be set apart from the world and we're trying to, but, but, but at the same time, we're, we're living our lives in the world and we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to be set apart unto him, but we're still going off and doing Oh, we're going to the hot springs for fun. Oh, we're going to the, you know, going to the beach, going to the coast. What are we doing for him with our saved lives? That's what the parable of the meanness is all about. And, you know, I don't mean to be judgmental, but from what I have seen, most of our brothers and sisters in Ephraim are completely washed up on this point. I don't mean to sit in judgment of anyone, but when we take a look at dedication, it's like you can see that the workers are few and the harvest is enormous. Therefore, pray, master of the harvest, that he sent out workers into the harvest. 
but if we have eyes to read, isn't Yeshua saying that we need to make hearing and obeying Yahweh's voice, his voice, our tip-top priority in life? Isn't he telling us to dwell in him, abide in him, and him in us? That should be our number one thing in life, never to be separated from him. She tells us to do the whole will of Yahweh and not only parts and pieces, right? He tells us to pray and ask and knock until it's this way with us, until this becomes our second nature. So, at least to us, the lesson of Parashah and more is that Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever just like his father is. So just as Yahweh was speaking to our forefathers in the past, if he's the same, he's still speaking with us today. Read Proverbs 8. Maybe some of us are a little hard of hearing. we got peanut butter in our ears. Maybe because we don't value it enough. We're listening to music more than we're listening to the voice of Elohim. We're listening to our own thoughts more than we're listening to the voice of Elohim. We were listening to the serpent tell us we don't need to obey everything Elohim says. As a case, do we value him enough? Because he tells us that this word is our very life. This is what keeps us alive, is to obey every word that comes from the mouth of Elohim. What if we don't want to do it? How are we more set apart than our fathers who were so displeasing they dropped dead in the wilderness, didn't make it into the land? Brothers and sisters, if we want to survive the tribulation that's coming up, if we want to survive Armageddon, if we want him to commit to us, don't we need to commit to him? You know, sometime we can talk. The Torah, Scripture, basically is a program designed to weed out the 99% who don't truly make a commitment to him, who don't truly learn to want to do things his way. You know, I mean, he needs a bride that doesn't want to do things his way. How do we figure that? You know, if we're willing, if we have ears to receive it, uh, the Torah is effectively one gigantic bozo filter. Okay, its job is to filter out those who don't truly love him and behave accordingly. Okay, brothers, if we don't love him enough to find out what he truly likes, and if we don't love him enough to change, so that we begin doing what he likes, hello, <laughs> yeah. then how do we believe he's going to take us as his bride? We're not doing the Torah. We're not keeping the ketubah. We're not obeying the bridal covenant because we don't love him enough or because we don't fear him enough. Why is he going to take a bride who doesn't? truly love him enough to do the things he wants her to do. Why would he do that? You're the king of the universe. You want the wise bride. You don't want the foolish ones. So the one more thing we should say on this is that if we want Yeshua's spirit, then don't we need to not quench it? Well, Galatim or Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 Shalak Shaul warns us that the flesh and the spirit are opposites. Okay, they're at loggerheads. The flesh and the spirit, that's the two opposite things. And they are contrary to one another. So basically, we have to choose one and not the other. So basically, we need to choose the spirit and not the flesh. So we don't get to be double-minded, hopping between two opinions. We don't get to hop back and forth between set apart and living our lives in the world. We don't get to choose between being set apart and then we do whatever we want. Okay? You know, there are plenty of Messianic rabbis, uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, book salesmen, prosperity doctrine, preachers, uh, 
passion for whatever percent of the truth, teachers, fakers, and other ministers. They're going to be happy to steal our crowns, brothers. And most of the Messianic world looks to them like they're heroes. They're not heroes. Are, are they preaching what Yeshua preached? Are they walking as Yeshua walked? Or are they providing a stumbling block for others? Well, let's ask ourselves, you know, because we hear people all the time saying, <sighs> we get a lot of emails, people saying we no longer need to set ourselves apart by keeping the commandments of Yahweh. That's not connected to righteousness. In Hebraic thought, righteousness is keeping the commandments of Yahweh. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, okay? righteousness is Torah obedience. Okay? Yeshua was Torah obedient unto the death. And this is the example he himself set for us as his disciples to strive for. Okay? But, you know, if, if there's no longer any need to walk set apart, according to the Spirit, to obey the earlier words of the Spirit. And then you don't understand why you can't hear the Torah. Okay, you, you're, not, you're not putting Yahweh first. You're not focusing on Him without fail. You're not turning away from the things of the world. Uh, you don't think you need to obey all the points of the Torah. Okay, so what do you need the set-apart Spirit for? If you're not going to set yourself apart from the world, what do you need the set apart spirit for? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Okay? And if, if we don't need to set ourselves apart from the world, then why does Sheol speak about the differences between the works of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit? <laughs> or perhaps are some people thinking that it's possible to have Yeshua's spirit but not to have to help contribute toward his kingdom by tithing and volunteering? Because we get, we get this question a lot, and it's not possible at all, because as we saw back in Yohanan, John chapter 14, and verse 15, Yeshua says that first we need to love him so much that we willingly keep his commandments. That means we're eager eager to keep his commandments then he will pray the father and then that's when the father will give us yeshua's spirit which will eventually lead us into all truth but the point is we have to get to that point we have to bring ourselves to that point where we love we we decide yeshua says right there in the great commission he says we are to immerse disciples who keep everything Yeshua said to keep. It's like, why is that rare, brothers, sisters? Why are we talking less than 1% of Ephraim wants to do what's written in Scripture? What does that, that speaks to me, it speaks the same thing about what's going to happen to the majority of Ephraim. They don't want to do. They know what it says, they don't want to do it. What's Yahweh going to say? Well, Thessalonikim Aleph, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 7, Shaliach Shaul reminds us that Elohim does not call us to worldliness. He does not call us to uncleanness. He calls us to be in set-apartness. He calls us to be in righteousness. Verse 8, Therefore he who rejects Yeshua's kind of set-apartness doesn't reject man, he rejects Elohim, who has given us, he's the one who gave us the set-apart spirit. We're going to reject the set-apart spirit because Yahweh is asking too much. Yeshua is asking too much that we keep the whole of the Torah. That's asking too much, even though that's the example Yeshua set. That's asking too much. Are you kidding me? So what he's saying here is the set-apart spirit, which we get if we're obedient, is supposed to lead us to live 
lives of righteousness. Again, in context, righteousness means keeping the commandments, keeping the bridal contract, becoming a righteous bride, obeying our ketubah that our forefathers swore to in Sinai. But the thing is, we only get his spirit by making a 100% commitment to Yeshua. We have to impress him. We have to show him. We're, re- we're not just talking about it anymore. We're really trying as hard as we can. So, brothers and sisters, what are we going to choose? You know, if we know this is what Yeshua wants, what are we going to do? What are we ourselves going to choose? We need to receive the Spirit so we can focus on Elohim. And Yeshua tells us how to do it. We have to walk in it and not quench it. So whatever we have to do, let's read Scripture not to see what heroes we are. Let's read Scripture to see what are the things that we ourselves are supposed to be doing to prepare for Yeshua's soon coming arrival. Today is the day of salvation. Shabbat Shalom.